Take your Bible this evening, if you would please, to Psalm 31. Psalm 31. The 31st Psalm. We are going to read the first seven verses together, and then we'll skip down and we'll read 13, 14, and 15 together as well. All right? So we'll read alternately like we usually do. <clears throat> Psalm 31, beginning with verse number one. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing to read God's word and beginning together on verse one of Psalm 31. Ready? In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. <clears throat> Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for a house of defense to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net they have laid privily for me, for thou art my strength. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. I have hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble, thou hast known my soul in adversities. And then verse 13 together as well. For I have heard the slander of many, fear was on every side, while they took counsel together against me. They devised to take away my life. But I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my God. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the Scripture here tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible. We thank you, Lord, for preserving your words for us that we hold copies in our hands tonight. And Lord, I pray that once again your word would work effectually in each of us who believe and that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to its church this evening. Lord, I pray you'll bless the special now. And Lord, may it turn our thoughts and turn our hearts towards thee. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant Oh. 
to sighing when hope within me dies I draw the closer to him from care he sets me free his eye is on the sparrow and I know Father, we thank you for that wonderful, wonderful truth. Your eye is on the sparrow, and I know you watch me. Lord, you said not one of those birds falls to the ground, but you notice it. And even the hairs of our head are numbered. Thank you for caring for us and for <clears throat> being involved in our lives. And Lord, I pray you'll help us tonight as we look on uh, this portion of Scripture this evening from the 31st Psalm, and we... Spend time thinking and meditating upon the words that David penned here, that his times are in your hand. Help each of us to concentrate tonight and to listen carefully to what uh, you would say to each one of our hearts as we look into your word this evening. Help me as I bring the message and help each individual as they listen. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You've heard it said, at times people say, just come to Jesus and everything will be all right. That's not really true. Uh, you come to Jesus and your sins will be forgiven. You come to Jesus and you'll get eternal life. You come to Jesus and your sin problem will be solved and your salvation will be settled. But the truth is, if you have marital problems and you get saved, you're still going to have marital problems. If you're deeply in debt financially and you get saved, you're still going to be deeply in debt financially. If you've had physical problems and you get saved, you're still going to have some physical problems. You see, the battle is raging here in David's life in Psalm 31. And <clears throat> in fact, he says, my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. That's where David was right then in his life. He, he, wasn't, he didn't have a real positive outlook on things. He uh, needed to tune in to Mr. Osteen and get a different outlook on his life, I guess. But you know, life is sometimes a series of battles. And sometimes it seems like, well, if, if I... Uh, everything's okay at work, then I've got a battle on the home front. Or if uh, everything's okay at the home front, then I've got a, a, a battle on the, the relationship front. Or if, if everything's okay uh, with my relationships and on the home front, I'm battling some physical problems. And, and it just seems like it's hard to get everything set on every single battle front where everything's all, all calm. It just seems like there's always a battle going on somewhere. And there's battles to fight. And David felt that way. And so he finally says in verse 15, he says, My times are in thy hand. That's an amazing statement. What he's saying is not just my times, but what David is saying is my, my ways, my circumstances, my days, my situations, my life, my soul, everything about me is in the hand of God. Everything that has to do with me is in His hands. Oh, that we would learn what David learned in verse 15. That our times, our ways, our circumstances, uh, my, my situations, my life, my soul is in the hand of God. He's, it, we're in the hand of God. He's in control of our life. As a believer, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are 
God's. We're in the hand of God. He's the potter. We are the clay. And so He is hands-on fashioning and molding us. He, he gives us power and He gives us security. He gives us protection. He gives us guidance. He gives us direction. He gives us satisfaction. But we have all of those things because we're in His hands. I want you to think with me about Joseph for a minute this evening. Joseph, as you remember, as a teenage boy, dreamed some dreams. And they were God-given dreams. And Joseph, in, in, uh, as we look at it from our vantage point, we, we surely think he should have just kept those to himself. But he went ahead and told them to his brothers. And the Bible says his brothers hated him. Uh, you talk about a dysfunctional family. They had one, even before they knew what that word meant. And I, I, I'm sure there's times as Joseph would think about those dreams. And by the way, the dreams he had were, uh, I'm, I, I'm the, the, the main guy and everybody's bowing down to me. Uh, they're all going to serve me. And obviously that didn't set well, him being the next to the youngest of 12 brothers. And uh, the, the 10 that were above him didn't take too kindly to that. And so one day as he went out to check on them, they took him and stripped him naked and threw him in a pit. In fact, they intended to kill him. They didn't kill him and they thought, well, we'll throw him in this pit. Usually, people in that, that part of the country would, would dig big pits and at the bottom of the pit, they would put sharp stones that they had sharpened or rocks so that when an when a animal would fall in, they would get pierced through and it would kill him. And, of course, they would leave him in there for when the animal falls in, they'll tear him to pieces. That was their goal. And so here he is thinking about these dreams, thinking about what, what God had given to him. You ever think about Joseph as a teenage boy? Stripped naked in the bottom of a pit? The Bible says in another place that he cried in anguish. He was in distress in that pit, and you understand that. He was pleading for his life. I don't think he had a thought in his mind right now, boy, God, this is wonderful. I see how this is going to work out, just the way I dreamed it would. I'm sure it didn't make sense to him at all. And he was crying out to God, trying to understand, God, what, what, what are you doing? But yet he gets out of there, and they, they sell him as a slave to the Midianites who go down to Egypt and put him on the auction block in Egypt, and he's sold as a slave to Potiphar there. And again, I don't think he saw any of that as, God, this is really, you're really fulfilling your plan. Until things go well. He gets promoted. Until eventually, having worked for Potiphar for a while, he's in charge of everything. There's anything that's done in, under Potiphar's realm is done by Joseph. The only thing that he says you can't have any jurisdiction over is my wife. Probably because he didn't have any over her either. <laughs> but that's another point. But you understand, he said, not that, so anything else. And of course, I'm sure Joseph thought, well, maybe this is what's going to happen. Man, I'm moving up here. I'm getting to be well known. Maybe I'm going to move up and people will see how good a job I'm doing here and I'll get promoted out of here and I'll move on up the ladder politically. Maybe he thought maybe this is what God's going to do. Until Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him. He runs away to flee her advances and she pulls his coat off from him. And when people come in, she goes, oh, he tried to force himself on me. And Joseph, hey, there's no trial. <laughs> there's no, uh, it's much like the, uh, some of the media frenzy today. You're guilty until proven innocent. And, and, and so Joseph's thrown in prison. And he's in prison for several years. And, and he gets to know, and by the way, he advances in the prison. But I'm sure there were days in the prison as he's marking the days off on his calendar if there was one on the wall, you know. Marking his time to get out of jail. That I wonder if he ever thought about those dreams of a teenager. And I wonder if he ever thought, yeah, this is just how I thought it would go. You know, if you think about your life, and, and if someone asks you, is 
your life, has your life followed the path you thought it would when you were 18 years old? And people thought, what do you think, what do you see yourself doing in 20 years? What do you see yourself doing in 30 years? How do you see your life unfolding? There, there's not many, if there's any, that would say my life has gone just how I thought it would. You know why? Because your times are not in your hands. Your times are in God's hands. He's the one who takes care of it. Now, what was, what was God doing? What was God doing in Joseph's life? What was God doing with David? You know, David got anointed to be king and then waited 20 years till he could pick the throne. 20 years for God to remove Saul from being king. And David waited, though David had opportunity at times to take Saul out and was encouraged by some of his men to do so, David said, I won't lift up my hand against God's anointed. What was God doing? There's several things I think that we need to remember when we think about the fact that we're in God's hands, and, and as Joseph was, and as King David was. Number one, let me give you three thoughts. You're in God's hand because God was advancing him, or God is advancing you. Here's our, here's our problem. We only think good things advance us. We only think good situations advance us. But God uses all things for his advancement. Joseph couldn't see at the time that being thrown into a pit and being sold as a slave, now that would be advancing him towards what God wanted, what vision God gave him. He didn't think how that's possible. Because we don't ever think that something hard or something negative in our eyes or something that's adversity or something that's suffering could be the plan of God. That's the same as Peter when Jesus said, I'm going to suffer many things at the hands of the, at the priests and the elders and I'm going to be crucified. And Peter took him again to rebuke him. He said, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Why? He couldn't, he couldn't understand how could suffering and how could death be God advancing His kingdom? How could that be possible? But God can use all things to advance His kingdom and to advance His will in our lives. I don't know the trial you're going through and I don't know the circumstances you're facing, but it may be that God's advancing you. I don't know, but I know this. I know that your times are in His hands. Elijah is by the brook during the time of famine, a famine that God told him to announce. And he had a book there where he went and God gave him the water and the ravens came and fed him. But after a while of the famine and the, the, the drought, then the brook dried up. And he sat there and all of a sudden no water is coming through the brook anymore. And, and, and I'm sure Elijah had to think, okay God, what now? Huh. What, 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 what's next? And God was trying to let Elijah know and he let him know, I don't need a brook to take care of you. I don't have to have a brook because you're in my time, you're in my hands. Later on, when he faced the prophets of Baal, and he called the fire down from heaven, and then he, he won the great victory and slaughtered the prophets of Baal, and then they said, Jezebel's coming to get you. And he ran. It's amazing to me he could kill 400 prophets of Baal and then run away from one woman. Now maybe some of you women understand that. But uh, he, 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 he just took off. And, and, and you remember what happened? He went over and he, and he ran, he ran, he ran, he got under the juniper tree. And when he's under the juniper tree, remember what he prayed? Lord, take my life. Now, it's important to remember, and I, I won't go into it here, but you know, the Lord didn't say anything to him. You know what he did? He sent an angel who gave him something to drink and something to, to, to eat, and then let him sleep. He was exhausted. Sometimes... Listen, the time to make any spiritual decisions is not when you're physically exhausted. You'll make the wrong decision. Okay? And, and thankfully, God ignored that prayer. But you remember what he said later on, Elijah, when he got to where God wanted him to be? He said, I'm the only one standing for God. Huh? You see what his, his outlook was? I'm the only one. And God said, you know what, Elijah? I have 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal or went on to worship him. Now, 
that 7,000, I'm sure it shocked Elijah. But it didn't shock God. I'm sure that was a surprise to Elijah. But it was not a surprise to God. God's trying to let Elijah know, Elijah, I have it under control. Elijah, your, tan- your times are in my hand. I thought about the disciples when they saw Judas betray Jesus. They saw the soldiers come and arrest Jesus. They then witnessed the trial that eventually led to Calvary and the crucifixion. They watched him get put in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. And you know, during the next three days and three nights, nothing happened. You didn't hear anything from any of the disciples of Jesus Christ. No sermons were preached. No healings took place. No one was baptized. It was a pretty dark and depressing time. In fact, you find out that what they most of the time they spent was locked in the upper room. They were scared. I think they really believe they got Jesus, they're coming for us next. And I think they believe that. But you see, if they'd have checked with heaven, if anybody would have have checked in with God during that time, they'd have found out that in heaven they would have been singing, everything's all right in my Father's house. Everything was just exactly the way God said it was going to go. It was exactly according to plan. The Son of Man will spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and then He'll rise again. That's a sign of the prophet Jonas. Jesus said that would happen that way. It was all according to God's plan. You see, if they'd have checked with heaven, they'd have known resurrection day's coming. Jesus will conquer death. Jesus will rise from the dead. You'll see Him again. And He will not only be alive, the Bible says He'll be alive forevermore. They just didn't check in with heaven. And I know sometimes when you're in the middle of a trial, when you're in the middle of the difficulty, you're just, we get just like the disciples. And it's pretty gloomy, and it's pretty depressing, and it's pretty dark. And oftentimes the last thing we do is what we ought to do, and that is let's check with heaven. And you'll find out that God knows exactly what He's doing. Our times are in His hands. And if we just check with Him, you'll find out there's a resurrection day coming. And we all like resurrection days, but you have to go through death before you get to a resurrection. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like Brother Jarvis has said before, you know, we all like to hear the great answers to, to, to prayer and all the, the, the faith in God and what God did, but most of us don't want to experience that. We want to experience the faith part. We don't go through the trial that we had to put the faith that God was going to take care of it. And that's what God wants to do. He's going to advance us when our times are in His hands. But the second thing that we see David said, look at verse 7. David said, I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble. Notice, thou hast known my soul in what church? Adversities. So David is saying here, the second reason we're in God's hands is so for him to know our soul. You remember the story of Abraham and Isaac when he was told to go sacrifice him? on Mount Moriah. And, and when he went up there, and you know the story, he laid him down and he eventually raised the knife up and he goes to bring the knife down. The angel calls out of heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And he hears the voice and he stops. Do you remember what God said to him? Now I know that you love me. What was he doing? He said, I've proved your soul. Now I know. Because you haven't withheld your son. See, every now and then, this was the promised son. This is what Abraham had waited for. This was the miracle son at a hundred years of age. And, And God is saying, now, does Abraham love what I've given to him more than he loves me? I don't know. Let's see. And the New Testament, we don't know from that passage, but the New Testament tells us that Abraham would have taken his life believing that God would have brought him back from the dead. 
That's how much faith he had. And God knew his soul in adversity. Knew his soul as he went through that difficult trial. You know what? Will you obey God even when you don't understand? Will you obey God when things get tough? Will God be able to look at you and me and say, now I know that you really love me. That you really love me. You know, when Job, you're, you're in Psalms, just, just turn back to your left there, right before Psalms to the book of Job, Job chapter 1. We know all that Job went through, losing his livestock and his house and his business and his children all in one day. And talk about adversity. <laughs> Job was in adversity university. And notice what it says in verse 20, after all this went down, Job arose, rent his mantle, that means he tore his mantle in two, shaved his head, isn't that good, Xavier? And he fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. <clears throat> Think there's a reason God put that in there? Any of us ever go through difficult times and begin to charge God foolishly? How many times you heard people say, God, why am I going through this? I don't know why this happened to me. I don't know why I have to go through this. Job, Job is, is here to... And by the way, that was Satan's accusation. Job serves you for naught. He says he serves you because you've put a hedge of protection around him and nothing bad ever happens to him. You take that away and you, you let me at him and he'll curse you to your face. He'll charge you foolishly. That's exactly what he was saying. And God said, okay, I'll take you up on that. Job came through. God... God will know our soul. And by the way, so will we. Not, not necessarily in good times, but in hard times. In adversity. In difficulty. You really, you really don't know who you are until you go through a hard time. When you're the, one of the worst things that can uh, one of the hardest things to do when you're coaching a, a sports team is have a team that's won every game. Because they don't think there's anything they need to work on. You know when it's easy to coach a team is after they've lost a the game. Now they know. <laughs> we got problems. We got issues. We can be beaten. And you know, sometimes God allows those adversities to come so we don't get lifted up. We don't think we got this. I cringe when I hear people in our RU program say, I got this. Oh, you're in trouble. You don't have it. Okay? You, by, by the grace of God, you've got it. With the help of God, you've got it. So God knows our soul in adversity. So he, we're in His hand uh, for Him to advance us. We're in His hand for Him to know our soul. Let me give you number three. Go back to Psalm 31. Would you please? Psalm 31. And notice verse number 19 with me. Notice what David says here. Psalm 31, verse 19. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. How great is thy goodness. In fact, he lays it up for us. It's, it, it, I, I'm, I, I trust in thee and I'm, I'm, my times are in your hand and God says because you're in my hand it's so I can be good to you so I can lay up goodness to you 
Look at Ezra, the book of Ezra, please. Ezra chapter 7. Ezra coming back to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem, or the temple of Jerusalem. Nehemiah rebuilds the wall, Ezra rebuilds the temple. And in, in Ezra 7, look with me at verse number 9, would you please? Notice the Bible says, And upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month he came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. Look at chapter 8 and look at verse number 18. Notice it says, And by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding of the sons of Malai, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, and Sherebiah with his sons and his brethren, 18. Notice, by the good hand of our God upon us. Now look at chapter 9 of Ezra in verse number 22. I'm sorry, that, that's not right. I've got 922 down and that's not what I'm looking for. There's another verse where he mentions again the good hand of our God upon us. And I wrote down the wrong scripture, but that's all right. You understand what he's emphasizing is that the hand of God was upon them for good. That God would provide for them, that God would guide them, that God would protect them, that God would take care of them by His good hand. It's not all state that has you in good hands. It's God that has you in good hands. The, our times are in His hands. Do you ever think about with His hand? He touched the eyes of blind Bartimaeus. With his hand, he raised the dead to life. With his hand, he held up Peter when he would have fallen beneath the waves. With his hand, he, he raised up his hands and rebuked the winds and the waves and there was a calm. With his hand, he broke the bread and the fishes and fed 5,000. And through those hands, they drove nails one day and nailed them to a cross. But I got news for you. Those hands reached down one day and saved a young boy and gave me eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. And he wrote my name with that hand. He wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And when you got saved, he wrote your name in the same book of life. And with that hand, through the years, he's guided me and empowered me and protected me and held me and kept me safe. I'm thankful tonight to say my times are in his hand. And He's been good to me. And I think you would testify He's been good to you as well. I'm in His hand for advancement, in His hand for acknowledgement, in His hand for goodness. There was a little boy who was playing outdoors and he found a caterpillar. And he carefully picked it up and took it inside to show his mother and his mother asked, asked his mom if he could keep it. And said, she said we could care for it if he took good care of it. So he got a large jar from his mom and he put plants in to eat and a stick for it to climb on and every day he watched the caterpillar and brought it plants to eat. One day the caterpillar climbed up on the stick and started acting strangely. The boy got worried. Called his mom. He came and she understood the caterpillar was beginning to create a cocoon. And so the mother explained to the boy how the caterpillar was going to go through a metamorphosis, a, a change and become a butterfly. Well, the little boy was thrilled to hear about the changes his caterpillar would go through. And so he watched every day, waiting for the butterfly to emerge. And one day, it happened. A small hole appeared in the cocoon, and that butterfly started to struggle to come out. At first, the boy was pretty excited. But then he became concerned. The butterfly was struggling so hard to get out, but it looked like he couldn't break free. It looked good, like a desperate situation, like, like he wasn't making any progress. And so the boy decided to help, and he ran and got some scissors. And when he came back, he snipped the cocoon to make the hole bigger, and the butterfly quickly emerged. And as soon as the butterfly came out, the boy was rather, rather surprised. It had a swollen body and small shriveled wings. 
He continued to watch the butterfly, expecting that any moment the wings would dry out and enlarge and expand to support the swollen body. And uh, He thought in time the body would shrink and the wings would expand. But nothing happened. The butterfly spent the rest of its life crawling around with a swollen body and shriveled wings. It never had the chance to be what it was designed to be. It never was able to fly. As the boy tried to figure out what had happened and what had gone wrong, he learned that the butterfly was supposed to struggle. In fact, the butterfly's struggle to push its way through the tiny opening of the cocoon pushes the fluid out of its body and into its wings. And without the struggle, the butterfly would never ever fly. The boy's good intentions only hurt the butterfly. And our good intentions can often hurt us and circumvent God's purpose for us going through our struggles so that He can advance us, so that He can purify us, so that He can conform us more to the image of His Son. When David said, My times are in your hand, He's expressing his belief that my life and my life circumstances are under your control. And I'll trust that you do all things well. Thank God my times are in his hand. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, I pray you'll take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful, wonderful promise. Lord, thank you that you had David put it in the Scripture. Thankful, Lord, that We can say our life, our times, our situations, our circumstances. And Lord, forgive us at times when we're struggling. We want to circumvent the process and we want to go grab our scissors. We want to cut things short. We want to try to make it easier. But then we never accomplish. We never allow you to accomplish in our lives what you desire to. Forgive us for that. Lord, tonight I don't know what everyone's dealing with or what people are going through. But I know that we're all in your hand. And Lord, I pray that each of us would be content to be there. And knowing that we're in your hand for advancement. We're in your hand that you might know our soul. And we might know our soul. And we're in your hand for you to be good to us. You lay up goodness for those that trust in thee. You're a good God who does good things for us. And so, Lord, we trust you. And Lord, I pray that we'd realize that we are not in control of our lives, but you are. And so we trust that you know what's best for us. And I pray no matter what we go through, we could be like Job and say, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Father, speak to hearts tonight. I pray it's been an encouragement. And I pray folks will take heart in saying my times are in his hands. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many folks tonight would just say, Preacher, that, that promise is something I needed to hear tonight. That I'm in the hand of God. That he's in control of my life. That I can't determine what's going on as good or bad. But God can use all things for Him to advance His will in my life and His purpose for my life. Just like He did with Joseph. Just like He did with David. Just like He did with Job. That God wants to know my soul in adversity. That God can say, now I know that you love me. That God can lay up His goodness for me. Because I'm trusting in Him. My times are in His hands. I wonder if you say, Preacher, the Lord has spoken to my heart tonight. Pray for me this evening. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Amen. Amen. Boy, that's good. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. The Lord has spoken to you. Why don't you bow the knee to Him and say, Thank you, Lord, that my times are in your hands, that you're in control of my life. And He'll do, listen, He'll do so much better than you will. Don't, don't, don't try to shortcut the process. 
He's, he's working in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. Thank you for this great promise that you had David pen for us in the 31st Psalm. And I pray, Lord, as we, whatever it is that we're dealing with, whatever situation, whatever circumstance, whatever it is that we're going through, we remember this promise that our times are in your hands. We love you. We thank you for loving us. And I thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. May your will be done now in each of our hearts during this invitation time. Hear our prayer to thee tonight. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist will play. As she plays by the Bible, sing. The Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening. Will you please? Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? Right. No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace, through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there. Sin no more have dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a well that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Sing that with him, will you? Turn, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Father, thank you for being a good God to us. Lord, you've been so good to our church. It's been a, just been an amazing year at Bible Baptist Church, and we thank you for how you've taken care of us and how you provide for us, and Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. Our times are in your hands, and Lord, I pray your blessing now on each individual as we leave this place tonight. Make us mindful of your presence as we go. I pray, Lord, again for those who are not feeling well tonight, please strengthen them, bring healing to their body, that they could be here Tuesday night for our worker appreciation service. Lord, we go from this place and we pray that others will see Christ in us this week and help us to have grateful hearts for all you've done for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We're going to sing, It's a Grand Thing to Be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. If you want to get your uh, Christmas dinner tickets, uh, Carol Coleman will be down there, and uh, you can just see her and get that taken care of. And even if you don't have the money tonight, sign up for her, and then she'll put you down, and uh, we'll get set on that. Okay, the other sign-up sheets are down there as well. Don't forget those. And uh, don't forget Tuesday night. Okay, if you forget, have a good time Wednesday night by yourself, okay, because we won't be here, all right? And uh, the three-by-five cards are back there. Uh, make sure you grab one of those on your way out if you want so you can have that filled out when you come Wednesday night. We'll collect those and then read those as part of our service on Wednesday evening. Okay? It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know.
Here we go. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go for. It's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.